This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, I am so honored that Jamie Marisotis has come here to talk with us today about his new book, America Needs Talent. Uh, Jamie, I, I asked him in just a few minutes before we started here to tell me about his path to being head of the Lumina <laughs> Foundation. So I'm going to give you the unofficial, not the official oh, biography. Good, good. Uh, Jamie was an undergraduate at Bates College, where he's now a trustee. After college, he went to work for the college board, where he learned a whole lot, and then left the college board to become an independent consultant in higher education. From there, he became the executive director of this bipartisan commission that the book talks a fair amount about, the National Commission on Responsibilities for Financing Post-Secondary Education. It's the longest name in federal policy history <laughs> for a federal commission. And um, after that, he founded a, a research and policy um, uh, uh, organization called the Institute of Higher Education Policy, and from there he became the, um, the president of the Lumina Foundation. The Lumina Foundation is one of the most important foundations in higher education today, and Jamie is one of the most important, provocative, and significant voices in higher education. We're going to get a chance to hear from him. Uh, this is going to be a Terry Gross-type conversation. Um, I'll talk, ask Jamie questions for uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and then you'll have a chance to ask Jamie questions. So that's what we're going to do. I'm deeply concerned there's no one in the middle here. I'm wondering if that's a metaphor for, uh, <laughs> for our politics, probably. <laughs> not Berkeley's politics. If we're a metaphor Berkeley for Berkeley's politics. politics, it would be all on one side of the room. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> so I wanted to start with your definition of talent. Um, you, you have a very unusual definition. Most people think of talent as something you're born with, something that's innate, some very very special ability, but your definition of talent is really interactive, it's social, yeah. it represents a kind of complex of developed capacities and abilities yeah. that is socially important. And I, I wonder if you could start by talking about why you chose the word talent for the central concept of your book and why you defined it in that way. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the, the true story is, though, uh, I, I have few believers on this story. I had actually come up with the title of the book not thinking of the TV show, which, of course, everyone thinks of the TV show. <laughs> and the TV show, which I actually address in the book, because once I started writing the book and everybody said, oh, you know, the TV show, I realized that their definition of talent is precisely what I'm not trying to get at. What I'm not trying to get at is this idea that talent is about innate ability, that it is, in fact, uh, something much deeper than that. And in the book, I talk about the fact that, in, in my definition, talent really represents that combination of things, the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, the values, the interests, the personality traits that actually make up uh, a, a person who can be successful in life and in work. In other words, talent is what happens when all of those things come together, honed by education and experience and other uh, uh, strategies uh, that actually impact that individual and therefore impact our collective well-being as a society. And so um, it is this amalgam, this synergy of, of things that come together. And from my vantage point, the reason why I've chosen the word talent is that I think the word Talent is really what we should be talking about when we talk about the big things that we need to do to make America prosperous again. In other words, talent is the outcome of education, immigration, urban policy, all of the issues that I, that I get at in the book, uh, as opposed to what happens, and my public policy um, background probably shows throughout the book, what happens is we get so caught up in these processes and systems, and you can come to the conclusion that, in fact, what really matters is whether or not we have an immigration policy, rather than whether or not immigration policy improves our collective well-being as a country and makes the lives 
lives better for the, whether you are undocumented or here legally. Uh, you know, so the, this idea that, um, that uh, talent is something that you're not born with, uh, but that in fact is something where you can cultivate um, whatever, and I'm, I'm not an expert in innate ability, but whatever innate ability someone might have, but actually cultivate that and, and uh, aim it towards something that improves their well-being and therefore our collective success. That's really what I'm getting at when I talk about talent. Uh, I, that's really wonderful. It's a really revolutionary definition, not so much as a word kind of thing, but really as a different social concept. It's not, oh, you were born with talent or you weren't born with talent. Yeah. It's that we have a collective responsibility as well as an individual one to nurture, to grow um, the, uh, the, 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 the capacities that people have in order to increase increase our collective wealth in a human sense, That's not right. so much in a monetary exactly right. sense. So I want to turn to your critique of higher education. And I'm going to quote um, a sentence. Stuff. Yeah, our higher education system is dysfunctional, costly, largely unaccountable for its actual purpose. And you talk particularly about an institutional focus. Uh, you know, it's all about colleges and universities not being appropriate. Instead, you say, we have to focus on the students. So what are the implications of that? Could you tease that out? Yeah. We're all sitting here at Berkeley. Yeah. We have a pretty institutional focus. What, what, how, should we, how should we be thinking? If we, if we buy into what you say, how should we be thinking, those of us who work in colleges and universities, about what we should do? So uh, I think we would all agree that higher education has been a, an engine of social and economic progress for most of our history in this country. It is what's uh, made us more culturally rich, more uh, economically vibrant, uh, stronger, and more socially cohesive in, in so many ways. But it is what happens in higher education that makes all of those things possible, not the institutions themselves. And in fact, if you think about the rising demand for talent, which, which I articulate primarily in, in uh, economic ways in the book, but in a lot of ways I think are, are um, uh, um, just more difficult to describe socially, not less important. Uh, the economic and the social outcomes of, of higher education are increasingly having to do with what I was talking about in terms of talent, which is that individuals gain this great benefit from higher education, and that leads to their success and our collective well-being. And I worry about the fact that we conflate the idea that higher education is the institutions as opposed to the institutions being part of the ecosystem of higher education. So what is the ecosystem? Well, the ecosystem is the students, the learners, and what they represent. It's the faculty. It's the people who are actually associated with, with the, the, uh, the system, including employers, policymakers, uh, nonprofit organizations that might have an interest in these issues, as well as these institutions themselves, you know, these social structures that we call colleges and universities. But my fear is that we have spent so much time talking about the institutions, we've forgotten who's at the core. And who's at the core is the students and what they are there for and what they represent. Now, I don't in any way mean to suggest that the knowledge production function of higher education isn't important. It's hugely important. And it's one of the reasons why having great institutions like Berkeley is important because you've got to develop new knowledge. But here I'm mostly talking about the issue of knowledge transmission and ultimately the issues related to, to, to what really happens in terms of getting to that higher level of talent that we're talking about. So I just want to be clear here that uh, the, the institutions do serve a very important role in, in that sense. But they are part of that ecosystem. And I I worry that this uh, excessive institutional focus is one of the reasons why we've gone very deeply down this path of things like rankings and the fact that we spend a lot of time using input measures and using things that are, in fact, not about what makes a place like Berkeley great, uh, but in fact, um, talking about all of these indirect measures, all of these things that ultimately have to do with reputation, that have to do with, with resources and other things, as opposed to the intellectual capital, the human talent, that's actually the net result of what happens in the knowledge production and in the, in the knowledge transmission functions of the university. And so, uh, you know, I, I've, I've tried to make this analogy, it doesn't go over well in some audiences, but I've tried to make this analogy to the fact that we spend so much time trying to associate 
quality, which we don't know a whole lot about in higher education because we do not have very effective common measures of understanding what quality means. Quality right now is essentially defined largely by credit hours, which are time-based units and augmented by the decision-making within an individual institution as opposed to a broader understanding of, you know, your bachelor's degree represents certain types of knowledge, skills, abilities, values, interests, personality traits, like I said. We don't have that common understanding of what degrees mean, so we default to issues of the institution. So instead of saying, you know, does, does uh, you know, Professor Miller actually, um, is he, you know, does he, does he know certain things? What does he know? What, how can we actually tell that he knows things? We say, well, he teaches at Berkeley. And you say, well, okay, but so tell me what he knows. Well, in some ways, we have some, some measures to actually articulate that, but this association between the institution and what you actually uh, know and are able to do seems to me to be a pretty perilous, particularly in an environment where we need to meet that rising demand for talent in the country. We are way short of where we need to be. It's why there's such a, a huge wage gap in terms of, of people with college degrees compared to those who are not. The growing wage gap is uh, an, an indicator economically that, in fact, the labor market is has paying a premium for the people with uh, with college degrees, and that suggests that we have a real a real supply problem. So, you know, from 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 my vantage point, I think that um, this idea that um, you went to Berkeley and therefore you got a good education is no different than saying you went to the Cleveland Clinic and therefore you're healthy. It doesn't make sense to me. We, we have objective indicators that we can use in fields like healthcare or anything else where we can say, yeah, that person is healthy. We, we have some ways of understanding whether or not that person is healthy. We don't really have that in a common, in a common way in higher education. We have it within individual institutions. We set our own standards within institutions. Accreditors play sort of a role, but not, not much of one, if you believe the public policy debate. And so we're left with this environment where, in fact, we don't really know what the, what the degrees represent at a time when, in fact, we really need to better understand that because the country needs it. The country needs us, needs that ecosystem of higher education to produce the talent that, that it needs. That makes sense to me. One of the things that's one of the uh, you argue that all learning should count. Um, that there should be a way of assessing prior learning experience. But one of the things that's puzzled me about that argument for a long time is when you begin, when you teach a class, you have students that are all different levels when you start that class. And certainly, when I was a teacher, um, what I wanted was to enable every student to to grow beyond the point that he or she was. And if you say all learning should count, and there's, and there's some sort of competency-based system for assigning um, credits, for want of a, a better word, how do you make sure that every student, wherever she is, grows? Yeah, I think, well, I think it's a very valuable point. I, I, I think uh, the fact that we want every student to grow, I think, is really important. But I think we need to recognize that their individual growth has to get them to a certain level where they are qualified to do certain things in their life and in their work. And so it's not, not unrelated to the arguments that we've had in higher education about the difference between equity and equality, right? Equality in the definition is essentially providing this, the, the common base, the common platform, and then different people can stand on that platform and get to different levels. Equity is about making sure that everyone can get to a higher level uh, and assure that they're all achieving at this higher level so that they all can benefit equally from whatever that intervention is. And I'm a supporter of equity. I, I, I recognize the value of, of equality, but ultimately equity is what society needs because it's not good enough to get from um, level one to level three when society is going to reward you most at four or five. You want to make sure that you get everybody to four or five. That, that's the whole idea here. And uh, so I think from, from my, um, from my uh, perch here in a, a philanthropic organization, what we, we've tried to figure out is what is it that, that you can actually do to create this, uh, this higher level of 
knowledge, abilities, uh, uh, you know, uh, skills, et cetera, that, that we need. And it means that we've got to raise everyone up to a higher level. And obviously, some people are going to rise above whatever that level is there. But uh, getting them up, but not far enough to actually benefit in terms of, of what the labor market needs and what they need in terms of their democracy, I think is is uh, uh, really valuable. They, the uh, again, the economic indicators are so much easier to default to than the social indicators. And so I've spent most of my career arguing against the economic indicators. And in the book, I use all these economic indicators because why it's, you know, you use the data that you have. So let me mention a, another uh, one to sort of illustrate this point. So Georgetown Center of Education and the Workforce did a report last month that looked at the issue of, of what's happened to jobs since 2000, since the recession ended in late 2010. And what they found was that of the 6.6 .6 million jobs that have been created since the recession ended in 2010, they described about 2.9 million of those 6.6 .6 million being what they called good jobs. Now, their defini uh, definition of good job, which you can argue with, is that it pays median wage or above, and it has health care or retirement or both as benefits to allow you to, to prosper in your life. Based on that definition, 2.9 million of the 6.6 .6 million were, were good jobs that were created. Since, two, since the end of 2010. Of those 2.9 million, 2.8 million required a college degree. So, you know, we, we have clear evidence here that, in fact, this demand is very high for the kinds of stuff we're producing, but we're obviously not producing enough of it because that wage differential is increasing. The, you know, employers are, are pretty dissatisfied with the amount and often the quality of what they're getting. And so we, we've, we've got to tackle this. This is about literally doing more and better than what we're doing now. So if you were um, the chancellor at Berkeley, or if you were the president it seemed of the highly University unlikely, of California, but go on. Um, what, what would be the consequences of what you just said? What would you do to move a place like this closer to your sense of what needs to be done? Yeah, I think we'd want to have uh, conversations about uh, two things. One is, so what does it mean to have a, a degree from Berkeley, mm -hmm. and how does that relate to what it means to have a degree from any other institution mm -hmm. that is uh, educating the kinds of students, at least, uh, that Berkeley is is educating. I, I think that's a good starting place for that for that conversation. What mm -hmm. would it actually mean, and how could we tell? How would we actually have some sort of of way of understanding whether or not we are getting there. And you know, uh, some of the people in the room know that uh, Lumina Foundation has tried to contribute to this conversation in different ways. It's hard. It's messy. You get into issues about institutional autonomy, which I really understand, et cetera. We're certainly not trying to create a sort of lowest common denominator approach mm -hmm. here. What we're trying to do is raise the bar and find ways for institutions to have conversations within uh, the the academy itself, and then across institutions in ways that have validity, that have value. It's a it's a very complex enterprise, and it's a very complex enterprise to change, as you know from your mm -hmm. experience uh, being a president. But I think that we've we've got to get serious about this conversation. And back to your to your prior question, that you know I think part of what is a a risk for higher education is the increasing uh, dissatisfaction of employers and the fact mm -hmm. that the dissatisfaction of employers is making consumers more dissatisfied mm -hmm. affordability is becoming a serious concern for mm -hmm. for the for the general public uh, there are concerns about about uh, the production function etc and uh, we are no longer in the uh, vaunted perch that we were yeah, in society a decade or two ago. There's a lot of skepticism about what we're doing and whether or not it has value. And uh, you know, I, I say in the book, my intent here is not to murder higher education. It mm -hmm. is to modernize it. It is very important that we not throw the baby out with the bathwater here. This, this enterprise that we call higher education today is too important to our well-being. On the other hand, you're starting to see movement, particularly in labor markets, that suggests that employers are willing to reward people even if they don't have a college degree, if they can demonstrate that they can do certain things that they as an employer can validate. So you know, we should pay attention to what Google said. I don't think this is going to be a one-off uh, of an employer saying we no longer require a college degree as a prerequisite. Why is that? Well, from their vantage point, because it wasn't good enough to meet their entry criteria. Whether or not I agree with them, that, that's not the point. 
the point is that that was their that was their conclusion for that company, and uh, I, I don't want to see that become a herd mentality in terms of what employers uh, do and how they how they see. Um, uh, how they see the, the talent that's being produced. But I think it's incumbent upon us to be clearer about the learning that's represented with, with, with the degrees that we produce and how we can actually demonstrate that that is real and relevant and matters to, again, to them individually and to us collectively. So I want to read a sentence from your book that's relevant to what you just said. You, you say, in the ideal scenario then, in this new system, Every student will know where he or she is going, how much it will cost to get there, how much time it will take, and what to expect at journey's end, both in terms of learning outcomes and career prospects. I am exceedingly optimistic, aren't I? Uh, well, I, when I read that sentence, I kept wondering about the mess and muddle yeah. of kids between 18 and 22. Yeah. And when students used to, you know, you, you know, when I talked to the new students at Smith, I would always say, most of you are probably undecided about your major. Yeah. And undecided is a great thing to be. Yeah. How do you accommodate what is a period of self-discovery, of experimentation, of trying to figure things out with a sense of very definitive promises and outcomes? Yeah, I, I think that um, in that uh, one sentence, you should not be reading that I'm suggesting that we should uh, destroy the opportunity for exploration that I think mm -hmm. is really important in, in the collegiate experience. I simply think that we need to do a much better job of explaining what we are doing, um, how we can tell that what we're, we're doing matters, and tell the students what to expect in terms of their learning experience. I, don't, I do not think that it, that is an unreasonable uh, expectation mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the sector. And you know, we have to confront some of the, the, the realities of what uh, people are saying about higher education and figure out how we can at least meet them halfway, come, come their way. So if you look at what the public says about higher education today, what's the most important reason to go to college? By far, the majority of people say to get a good job. It is the number one reason by far. Now, I would argue that the idea of having a good job and a good life are equally important, that you should not try to say one is more important than the other. Higher education, for most of its history, has said, we don't prepare people for jobs, we prepare people for life. We've got to find a way to meet in the middle there and figure out how to actually articulate those two in different ways. Because from my vantage point, we are not hearing what the public is saying if we say, you know what, that job stuff, that, that uh, tell me where I'm going and what I need to, to know and all that isn't important. I think that is, uh, that is bordering on tone deaf. And, I, and again, I think it is a risk to higher education because you've now got these alternative opportunities for learning that are springing up. And if those things take root, I worry about undermining mm -hmm. American higher education mm -hmm. and the tremendous benefit that we all get from higher education today and that we will need tomorrow. Yeah, but we live in a work world now where um, young men and women can expect not just to have five or six different jobs, but five or six different careers. Right. And uh, I would make the argument that a broadly based liberal arts education is what best prepares someone for the kind of flexibility of um, intelligence and imagination that will be required to re-educate themselves repeatedly in the course of their careers. Yeah. Is there a danger in being too um, focused on what, on specific skills that employers may want? Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think, I think there is a real danger if, in fact, we see that uh, all that we care about is the outcomes that they need, because the outcomes that they are going to tell you they need are going to tend to be short-term mm -hmm. as opposed to meeting those, those long-term needs. And the other other hand, a lot of what the employers say, and this is the point where I think there is some potential for a meeting of the minds here, if we can figure out how to have the, the, the translational discussion, is that what the employers say repeatedly that they value most in their employees is critical thinking, problem solving, communicating, uh, all of those things. And it is what we say we do best in higher education. Mm -hmm. So trying to figure out why they say that's what they need and we say that's what we produce, but they say, no, that's not what we're getting, we've got to figure out how to meet them on that and find a better way to at least uh, come their way somehow without destroying what I think is all of the things that you're underscoring, which I think are important, which is, 
the ability for self-exploration, the ability to change your mind, the ability to actually find uh, opportunities to pursue different different career paths. And you're right that um, the way labor markets work now, the way uh, work works for individual, forget about the labor markets, is that people no longer work within industry or within job classification anymore. That that is uh, you know pretty much gone. Uh, the typical person uh, over the course of their work life is going to work across different industries, across many different job classifications, and it underscores the value of all of those core or generalizable things like critical thinking and problem solving that are so important. So it's really a plea to uh, find a different way to have this conversation, and all of those things that I say in that idealized sentence are things that we uh, hopefully can get to at some point. I'm, I'm, I'm a realist. I'm not sure that we're going to be there anytime soon, uh -huh. but I think it's worth articulating what would be uh, what would be um, uh, possible if uh, if we could actually have a different kind of conversation. Yeah, I wanted to ask you some questions about finance and higher education, which I know is a is a very important concern of yours and of the foundations. You say in your book you want to reform Pell. Mm -hmm. How how do you think Pell needs reforming? So uh, a couple of things. One is I was, you know, say first of all. I was a Pell Grant recipient. Uh, I was a first generation college student. Uh, I'm a walking advertisement for every financial mm -hmm. aid program you can probably think of. My freshman year, I got a Pell Grant. I did work study. I got a Perkins loan, a, uh, uh, what did they used to call them, George? Guaranteed student loan, now Stafford loans. Uh -huh. um, I got a scholarship for my church, a scholarship for my community-based organization. I, you know, so I. I uh -huh. represent uh, the system, uh, if there ever was one. I worked another job beyond my work study job. Um, the Pell Grant program, which I think is one of the most important programs that we have uh, at the federal uh, level, um, has done a good job at providing opportunity and access. But my concern is that it hasn't had enough of its eye on whether or not the students who are getting <coughs> access are actually uh, succeeding. Uh, I don't have the right solution here, by mm -hmm. the way, about how you actually do this. I've been involved in these conversations for a long time. There are different mechanisms for doing this, um, and I'm not sure which of them uh, really work. My point is that entry should not be, it should be a necessary but not sufficient criteria uh -huh. uh, in terms of our understanding of what Pell Grants should do. We should be thinking about how Pell Grants can actually incentivize success for the students so that more of them uh, persist and more of them actually complete in their mm -hmm. courses of, of study. And um, you know, thinking about Pell Grants in the context of a, of a broader system uh, where we can actually uh, reduce uh, debt, uh, particularly the excessive levels of debt that we uh -huh. have for that cadre of students that our public policy dialogue is very focused on right now, I think is going to be very important. And I think focusing on the success for students mm -hmm. is going to be hugely important in terms of the, the Pell Grant program. Oh, great, thanks. One of the things you recommend is STEP, Students Total Education Package yeah. that the Bipartisan Commission yeah. recommended um, back in the 90s. Um, and, and how do you, in other words, you fund the student rather right. than funding the institution. Right. How would you guard against abuse in the same way that Pell, I think, has been abused by institutions that are unscrupulous? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's a, that's right. Uh, I give it a new name, so you know we we called it the Students Total Education Package in this bipartisan commission in the early '90s. I call it the Talent Trust in the book, mm -hmm. uh, but the idea here is for there to be a much more student-centric way of articulating what the federal government's commitment is to you as yeah. that individual, as opposed to saying, what's your cost of attendance, and then we'll figure out how we're going to pay for cost of attendance with these different programs and try to match things up, et cetera, which gets very messy and complicated. Federal government says, you know, if you want to go to college next year, we're going to give you $20,000. And there's going to be a sliding subsidy scale depending on what your your resource availability is, what your need is. And for the uh, highest income students, it's going to be all in unsubsidized student loans. For the lowest income students, it's going to be mostly in the form of Pell Grants and other grant assistance. And then you have the sliding subsidy scale. Now, the people in the room have worked, who've worked on the legislative side, and who've tried to write legislation, like Bob Shireman sitting back there, will tell you this is extremely mm -hmm. difficult to write in law uh, because of the nature of getting from current programs to, to, to this kind of a model. But I still think that uh, this idea 
um, uh, has saliency. In fact, it's probably more relevant than it was in the early 90s, mm -hmm. given the high concerns about affordability that have shot up the income ladder uh, much more than they were in, in the early 1990s. There is a danger, as you point out, which is that if the federal government is making this commitment up front to a specific price, does that auto or a specific amount of money, does that mean that price automatically increases to that ceiling uh -huh. for, for everyone? And um, the evidence is mixed because we actually have some experience with this in states about whether or not states do this, for example, with Pell Grants for community college students. They, in fact, um, didn't, at least for a long time, all raise their tuitions to capture all of the Pell Grant money. So um, it, there is a risk uh, associated with that. I think that the uh, the idea we should my, my plea might be that we pilot it and figure out how we could make it work in some ways before we uh, go uh, whole scale on it. Um, but I think that the idea, the message that it would send to consumers, the fact that it would actually be a more rational system in an environment where um, it is an incredibly cacophonous set of programs and uh -huh. levels and is. ideas. Uh, for yeah. consumers, particularly for low-income students and their families to figure out this is a way of trying to cut through some of that. It's, it, it, it's, an, it's an idea that I hope we can test. We've been talking mostly about higher education, but obviously your, or your book has um, many topics that have um, a connection to talent. And um, some of the most interesting things you say are about cities. Do you think that cities are the most important hubs of social change? Is it that kind of regional locality that's the most important? I mean, I think we all know the demographic <coughs> data, which is that we've become an increasingly <coughs> urbanized uh, global society, and the United States is reflective of what, what we've seen there. So more and more people live in urbanized contexts than ever have historically, and will continue to do so. I've seen a very recent World Bank data on this that's, that's very compelling about the growing importance of cities. And, you know, I've I was influenced by the Metropolitan Revolution, which was done by uh, Bruce Katz and Jennifer Bradley at the Brookings Institution a couple of years ago, uh, and their idea that, um, in fact, cities have essentially become the trade zones of the 21st century, mm -hmm. whereas in the 20th century, the trade zones were largely country to country. In the 21st century, the trade zones are, are um, urban center to urban center, and so they're uh, I think the uh, the statistic was there's more trade between um, Sao Paulo and New York than there is between the majority of countries in the world oh. now. Yeah. And so uh, that, that idea, I think, um, brings us to this notion of, well, what are cities? What do they represent? And I refer to them as talent hubs. They are hubs of talent because, you know, in the sort of Richard Florida uh, uh, framing of it, they are places where the creative class can prosper and grow, but you need that concentration of talent, that concentration mm -hmm. of creative people to contribute to the uh, social richness, to the cultural opportunities, and to the economic well-being. And I think that, you know, that, that chapter of the book is sort of another plea um, to stop treating cities as problems we've got to fix in our society, as sort of economic and social wastelands where we're not sure what we're going to do with them. They are huge uh, opportunities for us as a society, not because people are uh, attracted to them. Uh, that's one of the points that I make in the book. But because, in fact, it is where people live. And we've got to make sure that we actually cultivate the talent that's in those cities, not simply attracting it. I, I do sort of make a point in the book here that I worry a little bit about this issue of talent attraction as a sort of zero-sum game. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, um, well, so, um, you know, Austin or Denver becomes very cool and hip to live in because they've got the mountains, they've got the music scene, they've got all these assets, and so people are drawn to those places. That's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with talent attraction from a sort of city perspective. But the evidence is pretty clear that the majority of cities that have attracted that sort of creative class that Richard Florida was talking about have done little or, in some cases, worse for the people who are already there in terms of their economic and social well-being. So in other words, what happens is it becomes a magnet for people from other places, but the people who are there, who are often low income and minority and first generation populations, mm -hmm. they 
they're the ones who are left behind in the in the process. And you know, I was in uh, New Orleans last month speaking at a 10th anniversary of Katrina conference, and I'm worried that this is what's happening in New Orleans as we speak. Uh, that you know, you do you cannot fault these idealistic, excited, mm -hmm. mostly younger people, mostly white uh, people who are attracted to New Orleans because they want to go there to do some good. But the problem is, if they're not actually harnessing what they are doing towards making a difference for the people in those communities, they're not going to do good. They're just going to displace people who, in fact, uh, have, uh, have no choices. Uh -huh. uh, and our emphasis should be on improving their lot, their well-being, by actually investing in, in their talent development and, and deployment. And so uh, I have a, a, an out-of-the-box example in the book, uh -huh. uh, not one yeah. that anybody's talked about, which is Grand Rapids, Michigan, a place yeah. that I spent some time on. Uh, and I chose it for a lot of reasons. One is it's a conservative Midwestern city uh, that sort of doesn't fit your model of, you know, of, of the kind of places that people are talking about. Uh, let's be honest, there's not a whole lot there to draw you to Grand Rapids. The rapids don't even exist anymore. <laughs> um, so um, it's, and yet they have been at this now for a while in Grand Rapids, and it's been in fits and starts, but they've developed this very collaborative model of building from the core out. In other words, actually saying, what are we going to do to make a difference for the low income, the poor, the minority populations in Grand Rapids, educationally, socially, culturally? And it's brought together the business community, the civic community, uh, a series of mayors, uh, the educational institutions, et cetera, and they've made some progress. It's not enough progress, it hasn't been fast enough, but I, uh, I'm really drawn to this idea that uh, you've got to collaborate, you've got to see that you have a common goal as all of the people who are there who aren't going anywhere, mm -hmm. and that you're committed to making that place better. Thanks. There are lots of other questions I'd like to ask, but I think it's time to throw it open to questions from you. Oh, let's talk about immigration. That's, yeah. That's... yeah, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Well, maybe we can talk about that because there is the uh, literature on brain drain. There's the literature also on brain circulation yeah. as people begin to either return to their home countries or invest. Or... But the reality is that America does need some or wants some of the international talent too. Okay. Some, and many of them are educated in their home countries that come to live out their lives in countries that promise better careers for them. So it is a loss to the sending countries yeah. as it is a gain to our countries. And just to comment on that in the notion of talent and needing talent and immigration reform. And yeah, well, you, you make a... You make a couple of very good points, one of which is that, back to my point about zero sum here, so if, so if our gain is somebody else's loss from an immigration perspective, that's not good. Uh, that's, not, uh, uh, that's, that's not helpful. Uh, there is, a, I think, a clear sense here, and you're seeing it in most of the developing and developed worlds, that, in fact, investing very heavily in talent development is a high priority for an awful lot of countries. And it's one of the reasons why you've seen educational attainment skyrocket in a lot of countries, whereas in the United States, we've had these sort of fits and starts increases just in the last few years after a very long period where there was very little, little change. Um, so as an American, I look at immigration as one of the things that has made us great as a country. It's one of the things that uh, really um, uh, defines who we are as a people. And, and there, again, back to the sort of hard numbers here, there's real evidence here that, in fact, immigrants have contributed to our entrepreneurial culture, to our social well-being, to our cultural richness. Uh, you know the disproportionate number of, of immigrants who are entrepreneurs, who are who are uh, who have been successful in in developing um, uh, new ideas, new businesses, et cetera, have been extraordinary. Um, that is not where we are right now in the country in terms of our immigration conversation. Where we are right now in our country is, is the the overwhelming. Uh, element of the conversation is that immigration is a problem and is a problem that we have to fix. And my view is that the only way around this 
is to actually find the right political will, the right political leadership to get comprehensive immigration form, reform done. We cannot simply talk about border security, which is, is probably a legitimate issue. I don't have enough, enough expertise to know. Uh, but that issue has been so um, 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 caricatured in terms of the nature of the problem. And you know, I've seen some pretty good evidence to suggest that this is not one of our top concerns in terms of the quality of our labor force and other things, that somehow with these porous borders are, are bringing people here and they're displacing people who can't find jobs. There, there's very little economic evidence of that at any part of the, of the, uh, of the, of the um, labor market, even, even at the low end. So my, my, my uh, perspective on this is that we've got to be thinking about a different immigration model, a talent-based immigration model. And several countries have gone through this in the last couple of decades and have done very well. Australia is what I profile in the book, but so is Canada, so have some others, in which they've actually gotten to a different conversation about what does immigration mean to us in terms of our labor force needs at the low end, the middle end, and the high end. So we, the U.S., you know, we sort of have this, oh, let's deal with the high end part of the conversation. But, you know, by the way, what about the dreamers? What about all the people who, you know, the, the, the 10 million people who are here, who are in the shadows, who we could actually turn into, you know, through an, an appropriate process, uh, give them legal status by actually giving them the tools that they need to be successful in a modern economy. Um, we've got to be talking about all of that in the in the same conversation. And by the way, states and cities are not well positioned to deal with those issues. Immigration is overwhelmingly a federal policy issue, and our lack of leadership on this at the federal level is just is problematic. Over, I would just make the plea that that should be enveloped also into our international aid policy, um, because I do think we have to recognize that. There are regions in the world that do experience a loss. They may not have yet the institutional conditions to, to retain their own highly talented people. And we do educate, particularly at the graduate level, a lot of talent from Sub-Saharan Africa, from South Asia, Southeast Asia, and so forth. And, and many of them are returning more, um, but still the evidence is out there that there are whole sectors and fields for which there is significant brain drain. So yeah. if we can bring that very sophisticated comprehensive immigration policy that you're talking about together with our international development and even capacity building, then we're going to see less win-loss and more win-win. That's a very, very c compelling point. <laughs> yeah, Henry. Um, you were asked this, but I'm going to ask it again. What should places like what should places like Berkeley and Stanford be doing? And are there different things that elite private universities need to be doing than elite public universities? Yeah. So you know, it's a, it's a challenging question. I, I so I'm going to make a confession here. I'm really not too worried about Berkeley and Stanford in the big scheme of things. You don't have uh, my job. Um, okay. <laughs> and and I say that because you know, look, if if we think about what the country needs. What these institutions are going to continue to do, because they, they, I think there is evidence that uh, they do some of this this well, um, they're going to educate a leadership class of people who will tend to be the civic leaders, the NGO leaders, the uh, the business leaders and communities, et cetera. Um, so I, I don't want to dodge your question, but let me make my point and then try to come back to your question. You know, if you think about uh, what American higher education is today. Um, I frankly think we spend too much time saying, what are we going to do about Berkeley and Stanford and, and Harvard and Chicago? Mm -hmm. And not enough about the other 95% of institutions which do not have, you know, one out of every 20 students in American higher education today goes to an institution where less than 50% of the students who apply are admitted. One out of 20. And yet we spend an extraordinary amount of time mm -hmm. talking about the pricing of those institutions, the uh, knowledge production function of those institutions, et cetera, and not nearly enough about uh, the, other, the other 19. So um, I do sure, think, Berkeley, right? I do think <laughs> that you know, what, what places like, like Berkeley can do is think about the transformation of the delivery of higher education in some new ways. You, know, you unfortunately do represent a model that is high cost, right? That the cost of delivery is very high. 
if you could figure out a way to streamline the cost side so that the price is more reasonable from the student student perspective, um, you can actually become a model for other elements of, of the system. And I think that's one of the questions. You know, this whole issue of the, the high cost privates with the sort of safety net of the endowments sort of, of uh, mucks up the conversation, I think, here, because those institutions, it's hard to know what's going to push them to actually change in a fundamental way because their teaching and learning models have served them so well for so long. But uh, it, this is a hard question because I think that you know we spend probably too much time already wa wondering what these institutions can do. I think they can be leaders. They can be models for the kind of change that, that's necessary. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure I want to spend a whole lot of external time or resources worrying about it because I think these institutions generally have the capital both literally uh, from a monetary sense and from an intellectual capital perspective to be able to figure out their own path going forward. I'm not sure about much of the rest of the system. We're still half to a third the cost of a Stanford though. Yeah. I mean, so we may be the high cost model, but we're... You mean price or cost? Both. Yeah. I'd like to see the cost numbers, actually. I'm, I'm interested in, in seeing the cost numbers. Yes. Uh, hi, Jamie. Um, my name is Christian. I'm a first year public policy student here at Berkeley. Uh, that's my game over there. <laughs> so, Better be a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, he already likes me. So. <laughs> uh, you know, it, when, when I look at the title of your book, you know, American Needs Talent, you know, I, I can't help but think that, you know, I, I, I feel like talent already does exist. It's just that it's not tapped into properly here in this country. Uh, and the only reason why I say that is because, you know, I'm also a first generation student and I'm sure you, you know, you heard the big conversations about how, you know, academically competitive students who come from the lowest socioeconomic backgrounds of this country are not applying to the top colleges and right. universities in this country. So, you know, I know, you know, institutionally, you know, Berkeley can change its recruitment strategies and attracting that talent or whatnot. But I'm just wondering, um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on like, you know, what role the private sector can play, if any, or, or government, because you know this is, you know, you know these places need to make sure that they ensure future employees or, or whatnot, or future members of Congress. Or, yeah, yeah. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on, on tapping into the, the way, that exists here. Your your point about about the fact that. Uh, talent is here is accurate in the sense that um, if we're defining it as the untapped potential, um, I think that's right. But we've still got to cultivate that talent. The problem is that we haven't done enough to help bring that, that untapped potential to scale in a way that's going to matter for those individuals and for us as a society. So in other words, I do think we literally need more and better talent uh, in terms of, of my framing. And so you know, this gets back to the early part of our, of our conversation in a way, which is that we've got to find a way to say, in fact, more and better are both uh, reasonable uh, outcomes, in fact, things that we should expect in a knowledge economy in a world where that demand for talent is rising. rising. Um, government and the private sector both have a shared responsibility here. Um, government is in a tough position uh, right now because of lots of bad decision making on the part of government in lots of other areas. And so it's tough to know what role government can play reasonably. Um, given the other issues that uh, that it's confronting. I don't mean to suggest that government shouldn't invest more. I believe it should. I'm not sure that it will or can, um, given uh, competing priorities. What I will say is that if we could do a better job of demonstrating that we're producing the kind of outcomes the country needs, it'll make it a lot harder for them to be cheap. And I think that's one of the issues that we've got to deal with, is focusing on more of that uh, a better explanation of what we're producing in terms of, of the investment in, in a higher education. Um, I think the private sector has a huge untapped potential here. This is one of my big points in the book is that uh, we've got to find a way of, even if you hate the Starbucks program, the Starbucks program is an interesting model of the fact that, at least in terms of what they were saying, they were trying to do the right thing here, right? They're trying to educate their employees, recognizing that the vast majority of them are not going to stay at Starbucks as employees. They're not going to stay, right? The, 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 the wages just aren't going to be sufficient mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the Starbucks business model for them to stay. And what you want to do is find more of that sort of enlightened companies that want to do the right thing for their employees, not just for the sake of benefiting 
benefiting their company, but benefiting their community. But you also want to tap all of that money that exists in private capital markets and actually apply it to what's happening here. And so I get into this sort of riff about social innovation bonds and public benefit corporations and other things in the book uh, that have to do with social innovation and the fact that you know there's very interesting stuff, still very nascent, very little of it happening in education right now. It's happening in other sectors, housing, prisons, lots of other areas, but not a lot in, in education, around this idea that you can tap capital from private uh, capital markets and actually literally apply it to social goals. And, uh, you know, so I do my, my uh, cheap math in the book, $200 trillion in private capital markets. If we took one one hundredth of 1% of the, of the money in private capital markets, one basis point, and applied it towards talent development in the United States, it would exceed the investment of the federal government in financing higher education today. So there's got to be a way to do that. There's got to be a way to actually find the places in the private capital markets where, in fact, they do want to do well and do good, and find ways for them to apply that in the context of, of talent development and deployment in the country. Because, you know, and so coming back to your point, for first generation populations, for low income populations, for, for other underserved populations, um, government has been the, the safety net, has been the, uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, primary supporter. But I'm worried about government's ability to continue to do that over the long term. I'd like a little hedging strategy to make sure that we can actually uh, continue to find ways to support those populations that deserve the support. Okay. Yes, question in the back of the room. A very brief comment first about, about Google. They blow hot and cold all the time about this. Um, uh, Ten years ago, they announced, after all our tax breaks, that Irish students were too stupid to work there. Yeah. And um, up to recently, they were really only accepting uh, people from the top five. Right, right, right. Despite the fact that neither uh, Page nor Bren actually did there right. on the ground there. But um, my questions actually are more, more political. Um, so um, it's actually, I think, impossible really to, to um, separate the public and private in the way that you've been talking about. The, um, it's well documented by people like Matt Tybee of Rolling Stone that um, the Fed differentially um, favored banks, um, other financial institutions uh, when they were bailing out. And at the moment, for example, example they're letting Glencore which is which yeah, yeah. real things go, go, go to hell. So my first question is that really, isn't there um, if, uh, a more a deeper role for government than perhaps you, you, you are um, outlining? And the second question I would have is about immigration. You're actually correct uh, about Australia and Canada, for example. They aggressively um, <laughs> recruited uh, healthcare professionals in Ireland. We lost about 10,000. And that hiring freeze was actually due to the um, recession and due to the fact that German banks lost a lot of money yeah, on, yeah. on bad investments. So don't we need actually, uh, in that context, a much broader debate? So the two questions then are about the financialized system and the fact that the uh, US government in particular is favoring um, this, this new way of doing things. And the second is about um, recession and globalization in general. Yeah, I, you know, I think, I think you may be I, I I don't know enough about the second to be uh, to to uh, clearly answer that, but I suspect that there's a lot of truth in what you're saying on both. I, you know I think that uh, part of the problem at the uh, federal level is it's hard to know what the decision making um, ultimately was was about in terms of the you know what happened in in the recession and in that time period when what was going on as you say there's been a, a lot written about it I, I do think that um, uh, the federal government's put itself into this box right which is that it has starved itself from a revenue perspective and as a result of starving itself from a revenue perspective, it has fewer and fewer options in terms of being able to make the investments that it needs in terms of broader uh, public good, uh, to, to, to use your language. So that's, that's really problematic. Um, so if I sound like a defeatist, uh, I, I don't mean to, but I'm worried that, damn it, they won. And so I'm trying to figure out how we get around that uh, and which is why I'm trying to figure out these more uh, practically oriented uh, hedging strategies to, to maybe uh, make a difference. And the, uh, the, the immigration issue 
Um, I think that um, we are a long way from where the Aussies and the, uh, and the Canadians are, and um, I'd love to have some of those problems. I mean, we are, we are nowhere near that. We, we have a, a, a very uh, outdated uh, immigration model, and my, my real concern is that we are closer to the sort of prejudiced immigration uh, restriction acts from the 1920s than we are towards the kind of progressive talent-based models that I think the country needs here in the, in the 21st century. And so I, I, you know, as a sort of practical political matter, I'm worried that the American psyche is, is, um, is not in a very good, good place right now. And every, you know, my book's been out a couple of weeks. Um, and in fact, I did an op-ed yesterday for Reuters on immigration. Uh, sort of talking about these ideas. And boy, you, you learn a lot of things you don't want to know about America when you write about immigration. Uh, but when you see how people react, it is, uh, it is very disquieting. Uh, it is, it's, uh, it's troubling. I, you know, I think our debates in education are sort of rough and tumble. Wow. Immigration's a tough, tough area. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of the deepest fears of people come out when you talk about immigration. And I think it's, uh, it's an ugly element of where we are in our national, not national psyche. Well, please thank Jamie for, um, for talking with us this afternoon. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much.